Uh, my name's Jackie Jacob. I'm at the University of Kentucky, and I am the coordinator of the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice at eExtension, and as such, I organize the monthly webinars. This month's webinar, we have Nathaniel Tablanti, uh, it's a professor and extension poultry veterinarian and associate director of the Center for Public and Corporate Veterinarian Medicine at the University of Maryland in College Park. He has over 30 years of experience as a veterinarian in government industry and academia. He has spent a large part of his veterinary career uh, as a field veterinarian in the Philippines, Canada, and the United States. He has more than 25 years of experience in poultry health management, epidemiology, and biosecurity, and has co-authored authored or co-authored numerous articles and educational materials on poultry health, biosecurity, and disease prevention. He has an extension program, a research program that involves investigating multiple poultry and zoonotic diseases of economic and public health importance and today he will be talking about zoonotic diseases of poultry that are uh, transmissible to humans. It's all yours Nathaniel. Oh I, I will be monitoring the, the chat and Q&A and, &A and um, if a question is pertinent to what he's talking about at that time such as a clarification I will interrupt otherwise I will hold all the questions to the end. Um, but please put your questions in the, the chat box, in the Q&A, and any comments you have or questions uh, pertaining to the webinar in the chat box. All yours, Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Jackie and Mark and all participants. Thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to give this seminar. Uh, and uh, let's start with the... Uh, Presentation here. Can everybody see that? Yep, looks great. All right. So uh, as uh, Jackie mentioned, I'm going to be talking about zoonotic poultry diseases today. Uh, we've all heard about so many poultry diseases, and uh, quite a few of them are zoonotic. Not a lot, but uh, we'll go over some of them. We can't discuss all of them, but we'll try to focus on the ones that are most popular or critical. So I'll go first through an introduction on what a zoonotic disease is, so that we're all on the same page. And I'll list some of these zoonotic diseases. There are diseases or zoonotic diseases from live poultry. Some come from poultry products, those that we eat. And then there are zoonotic diseases that come from other avian species. That means others other than chickens and turkeys that we are always dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and of course, lastly, uh, before we kind of uh, wrap this up uh, today, we'll talk about ways to prevent these zoonotic poultry diseases. So I hope that works for everybody. Let's start with what a zoonotic disease is. As uh, Jackie mentioned, these are diseases that are transmissible from animals to humans and vice versa. And some of these are born by poultry species. There are over 200 zoonotic diseases worldwide, and these diseases uh, include, uh, or pathogenic agents that cause these diseases, include bacteria, parasites, viruses, and fungi, among other things. And about 70% of emerging and re-emerging infections are vector-borne or zoonotic, uh, and that is not known to many people. In fact, we encounter these diseases quite a bit, not knowing uh, that they are circulating worldwide uh, in many parts uh, of uh, the U.S. as well. Uh, as you can see on the map on the right, uh, on the very far right here, uh, we have avian influenza, which was not known as a zoonotic disease for a long time until 1997 when it started to uh, jump species from poultry to humans, and I'll talk about that later. Well, why should we be concerned about zoonotic diseases? Well, for example, 2.3 billion human infections are caused by zoonotic diseases, and most of these occur in developing countries, resulting in about 2.2 million deaths. 
there's uh, increasing global pandemic prevention and preparedness. Uh, that's, of course, essential to achieving these global goals to end extreme poverty. And of course, um, people become poor because of these diseases that affect not only animals, but also humans for public health. So by 2030, the target of the World Bank is to make sure that people have enough to eat and that we minimize the impact of these zoonotic uh, diseases. Is that possible? Well, we can only do our best. And uh, the first thing we must do is to understand how disease, these diseases are transmitted so that we can prevent them. So let's start with the uh, zoonotic poultry diseases. Very few of them, as I said earlier, are really transmissible to humans. Most of them, in fact, are not directly transmissible to humans under normal conditions. And uh, according to Dr. Patty Dunn, my colleague at over at Penn State, most of these successful pathogens are highly adapted to the physiology and anatomy of the specific host. For example, some of these uh, infectious agents are just residing in a host uh, chicken or turkey, and they love to stay within that species and not anywhere else. We'll talk about these diseases in a bit. Just going over this list, it might seem a little bit overwhelming, but really uh, some of these uh, listed here that are not in red uh, are not as common as the ones that I will discuss that are highlighted in red, like Newcastle disease, avian influenza, Salmonella campylobacter, erysipelas, uh, avian tuberculosis, and avian chlamydiosis. As you can see here, for example, Newcastle disease, us, uh, manifests itself mainly as a form of conjunctivitis or eye irritation or redness and uh, transmitted mainly through poultry vaccines or laboratory accidents. Whereas avian influenza on the contrary, which is also a, an economically important poultry disease, can cause not only conjunctivitis and fever, but pneumonia and death in, in poultry, uh, in humans, I, I mean, so, or both poultry and humans. So we'll kind of pick and choose these, uh, the ones that are highlighted in red and go over them uh, as, as we go through this presentation. Let's start with zoonotic diseases from live poultry. So avian influenza, Newcastle disease, and avian tuberculosis are the ones I would like to discuss. Let's just review avian influenza for a minute. I know some of you know so much about this influenza virus already. It is, of course, a type A strain of the influenza virus. It is an ortho virus. It's the same type of virus that actually causes the regular seasonal human flu. Of course, even influenza is different in some ways from the strains of influenza that uh, infect people. But the virus is structurally uh, the same, as you can see here in this electron micrograph, with these uh, spike glycoproteins on the surface, which is what are called hemagglutinins in your remaining bases, or HNNs. So anyway, where does this virus come from? Well, they circulate mainly in reservoir hosts, which are wild migratory waterfowl, like wild ducks and geese. They're natural reservoirs in the sense that they harbor the virus, but do not, they do not get sick from the virus. However, when they shed the virus through their feces, they actually can spread it through to domestic poultry. And of course, our domestic chickens and poultry are not the natural host. Therefore, they can get infected with this virus. And there are two types in terms of clinical manifestations of avian influenza and domestic poultry. The low pathogenic avian influenza or LPAI causes mild or no clinical signs in some cases. Sometimes it's just a very mild conjunctivitis and facial swelling, as you can see here on the uh, top picture. Low to moderate mortality. Sometimes you can't even notice that anything's going on in a flock of chickens or turkeys until all of a sudden uh, you'll see a progressive uh, drop in production, then you get suspicious. And some of them, of course, uh, have some nasal discharge and respiratory difficulty later on. Now, the low pathogenic H5 and H7 strains 
are the most common, uh, commonly associated with mutations into highly pathogenic strains. And when they become highly pathogenic, this is what happens. Very, very severe clinical signs and lesions, along with very high mortality, sometimes reaching as high as 100%. It can decimate an entire flock, flock of chickens and turkeys. But in humans, when they get infected with even influenza, particularly the highly pathogenic type, for example, the H5N1 highly pathogenic type, it is very similar to the seasonal human flu, like coughing, fever, sore throat, muscle aches, headaches, and shortness of breath. So you might suspect that you just have the regular human flu when in fact you have the bird flu. How do people get infected with even influenza virus, it's mainly through direct contact with infected poultry, such as uh, surfaces and objects contaminated by fecal material from these infected birds. And it's always close contact that makes this happen. So in developing countries where it's very common to find these live bird markets uh, selling live poultry on the spot and processing them in front of you, then if these are infected, then you can see they are not wearing any personal protective equipment, uh, no gloves, nothing, just complete exposure to whatever infectious agents are there, uh, then there is a strong potential for an outbreak of avian influenza. And the jumping uh, of this virus from poultry to humans can occur in this kind of environment. The major outbreaks of highly pathogenic uh, influenza in humans uh, actually, as I said earlier, uh, occurred first in Hong Kong in 1997. This was highly pathogenic H5N1 that infected both chickens and humans. At that time, 18 people got sick and six of, six of those people died. So that's a 33% mortality rate. This was the first demonstrated case of a spread of avian influenza from chickens to humans. Now, they thought they had everything under control. In fact, uh, they depopulated the entire live bird market system in Hong Kong and pretty much put things under control. But in 2003, China and Hong Kong experienced the same outbreak of avian influenza H5N1. And this first occurred among members of a family from Hong Kong that had traveled to visit relatives in mainland China. One of those people in that family recovered and another one died. And this type of virus has been circulating in about, I'd say uh, 14, 15 countries in Asia, uh, the Middle East and some parts of Africa since 2003. Although initially uh, public health officials were expecting a major pandemic to occur from H5N1, it never happened. What we have are sporadic outbreaks of H5N1. It has not disappeared and it's probably gonna hang around as long as there are uh, reservoir hosts and uh, live birds that are infected continuously. There was an extreme kind of strange case in the Netherlands uh, of all places. Uh, you would probably not expect uh, somebody for that matter to die from an even influenza uh, infection in the Netherlands. But a veterinarian, a poultry veterinarian, who was a faculty member from Utrecht University, actually succumbed to this disease, which was caused by a highly pathogenic strain of H7N7 during their outbreak in 2003. And about 89 cases in humans uh, were reported, uh, but only uh, those humans only showed signs of conjunctivitis and some mild respiratory signs, except this one veterinarian who died from acute pneumonia. And uh, based on what I learned from my colleagues there, this veterinarian actually was suffering from human flu at the time of that outbreak, so it made things worse for him. Anyway, I don't want to belabor that issue, but these things can happen in rare, um, in extreme uh, infections sometimes. Okay, uh, any questions so far, Jackie, uh, before we proceed to the next disease? No, oh, okay, we're good. Newcastle disease is caused by another virus. This time it's a paramyxo virus. Uh, as we speak, there is an ongoing outbreak of uh, what they call a uh, 
a very uh, pathogenic uh, uh, Newcastle disease in uh, in California, in backyard fox uh, in California. But in terms of human infection, as I said earlier, Newcastle disease only causes mild conjunctivitis. So the virulent strains cause really severe disease on high mortality in, in chickens and um, turkeys. So it's usually transmitted by illegally imported exotic pet birds or fighting cocks, as is what's happening in California as we speak. Of course, there's also mechanical transmission through contaminated equipment, shoes, and clothing. So it's uh, target hosts are primarily chickens and turkeys, although most birds are susceptible. As you see here, uh, there's usually gasping, coughing, nasal discharge, typical respiratory signs, but Newcastle disease can also cause nervous signs like incoordination, paralysis, twisted necks, or what they call torticollis, uh, and discolored combs and wattles. Adults may only show respiratory signs and drops in egg production. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, eggs from chickens infected with Newcastle disease, they would appear to be soft-shelled or kind of uh, deformed. But in humans, that's all you can see. Uh, some eye redness. It's a little bit uh, uncomfortable if you get it, if you're in a vaccination crew and you're uh, handling live vaccines, then you might, if you're not careful, uh, end up with some conjunctivitis. It's not gonna kill you. It'll go away. So no worries, just a little visine will take care of the problem. All right, any questions so far on paramyxovirus or Newcastle disease? Nope. Nope, we're good. All right, uh, a little bit more uh, like uh, a, a rare type of uh, poultry disease that may cause infection in humans or disease in humans is avian tuberculosis. You know, you know the dreaded tuberculosis in the old days killed a lot of humans uh, when there were no antibiotics available. I guess these days there's still some circulating in the human populations, particularly in developing countries. But avian tuberculosis is caused by a, a very specific uh, a mycobacterium, uh, which is mycobacterium avian. And it's pretty prevalent in captive uh, birds rather than free and free living wild birds. So it's very unlikely that it'll be, it will be seen in commercial poultry because as you know, commercial poultry have a very short lifespan. And of course, husbandry practices like biosecurity and uh, hygiene and sanitation are very uh, well practiced in the commercial industry. So maybe this is nothing much to worry about, but I'm showing it here just for the record that it does happen once in a while. So this is a chronic wasting disease and some birds must, may just show lameness. Uh, if these chickens die and you open them up, you'll see some granulomas in the liver, some nodules, uh, also in the spleen, bone marrow and intestinal tract. And you might mistake this for Merrick's disease because unless you do some diagnostic testing, uh, virus, I mean, uh, bacterial isolation and histopathology, you will not really know what is going on or what's causing the disease. But this is just an example of what happens when a chicken or turkey is infected with avian tuberculosis. But in humans, it's really not a systemic disease, just like um, unlike human tuberculosis. Uh, what you'll see are just uh, skin lesions here, uh, local wound infections, swelling of the lymph nodes in some cases. So it's extremely rare and it usually infects uh, uh, people whose systems, uh, whose immune systems are compromised. For example, AIDS patients and uh, people with diabetes. Okay, any questions so far on those three diseases we've discussed so far? No questions. If okay. there are questions, I'll let you know. All right. Thank you. Zoonotic diseases from poultry products. I guess this is more common and I guess more interesting for us because if you've ever had or have ever experienced any of these uh, diseases, then you will know uh, through your own experience how nasty they can be. Salmonellosis and Campylobacteriosis are foodborne pathogens. 
bacteria, but there are various strains of salmonella, as you know. In, in, in this case, uh, we have host-specific and non-host-specific salmonella. Host-specific infections are caused by salmonella pylorum, also known as pylorum disease, which has pretty been, been uh, eradicated here in the U.S., and uh, salmonella gallinarum, uh, which causes foul typhoid. Now, those non-host specific infections are probably the ones we should be concerned with more than the non, um, more than the host specific infections. These are the ones caused by Salmonella enteritidis and Salmonella typhimurium. For example, Salmonella enteritidis and typhimurium cause these dreaded Salmonella food poisoning in humans. Foodborne outbreaks that cause severe diarrhea and it's pretty, pretty, inconvenient if you get uh, infected with these types of salmonella. And they come from these uh, infected or contaminated eggs and other poultry products. Now, I, uh, not, I'm not gonna spend too much time on pylorum and gallinarum because we've got them under control. But just for the record, uh, young chickens and turkeys are the ones usually infected with pylorum disease two to three weeks of age. Because of our National Poultry Improvement Program, which is a kind of a USDA-driven voluntary program, NPIP, uh, would pretty much put this, these uh, diseases, pylorum and typhoid, under control. All right, so let's move on to the paratypoid salmonellus. It is really, really severe when it gets to your system. Uh, it results in really severe diarrhea, fever, and abdominal cramps, and uh, Cases of food poisoning can sometimes be deadly. There are also some salmonella infections that become systemic that result in uh, multiple organ failure and people can die from salmonella. And I'm sure you've read in the papers as you've seen in TV, some of these salmonella outbreaks that have sickened or killed some people uh, and they were traced to some contaminated poultry products. Campylobacter, another foodborne uh, bacterial infection, though not as common as your salmonella in, uh, infections. Uh, they're caused uh, primarily by Campylobacter jejuni. They come mainly from backyard poultry and companion animals that are experiencing diarrhea. That, that would be your dogs and cats, mostly puppies. And of course, contaminated drinking water. Uh, that can also be a source of Campylobacter infection. In poultry, well, Campylobacter pretty much is a kind of a regular resident of the gut. So it's like a normal gut microflora. So you won't really see clinical signs that much. And uh, the problem is when this gets to people, when you ingest it through contaminated poultry products, then it's like a salmonella uh, type of uh, disease where there's diarrhea, sometimes bloody, uh, there's fever and abdominal cramps accompanied by nausea and vomiting. Simply, uh, uh, usually these symptoms occur within two to five days after exposure and last for about a week. And people get really sick and dehydrated and they end up being confined in a hospital and have to be given IV fluids and uh, antibiotics. So... Uh, just to, just a comment I wanted to make, I don't know if you're going to talk about it later or not, but with salmonella, it's also transmitted through the manure, mm -hmm. and they had a big outbreak of salmonella traced back to backyard poultry flocks where a lot of people got sick. Do you know anything about that? Um, not that specific outbreak, but you're, you're right there uh, because, uh, of course, it's, it's an intestinal pathogen or gastrointestinal pathogen. So any, anything that goes out of <laughs> a living animal that has these uh, infectious agents are likely to cause uh, human infections, especially if people, especially young kids in petting zoos, for example, they love to kind of, you know, uh, handle, you know how kids are. They like to touch and then put things in their mouth. So it's a kind of a fecal oral transmission that happens. So you're right. Uh, if it's in the manure or feces, it's going to get to you. So uh, while we think of it as a foodborne pathogen, it's also something that they can get if they don't properly wash their hands and take care of the birds. 
Right. Thank you for uh, for clarifying that. Yeah, it, it can be coming from the food or coming from infected surfaces. Thanks. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Jackie. Now, these zoonotic diseases from other avian species like parrots, there's chlamydiosis or psittacosis. It's often called parrot disease. And there's uh, erysipelas caused by erysipelas rusopathiae. Jeez, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Mm -hmm. Let's start with psittacosis. This is caused by uh, Chlamydocula psittaci. It's a, an obligate intracellular bacterium that really affects a wide variety of birds, but mostly citizen birds can infect turkeys and waterfowl, but it's usually pet uh, birds like parrots. And it's a very serious zoonotic pathogen because it can be inhaled. These pathogen can be inhaled um, through infected manure or feces and contaminated materials. And what happens it, is it causes acute pneumonia. And that kind of pneumonia is also called ornithosis. I don't know how they came up with all these terminologies, but chlamydiosis, psittacosis, ornithosis, they're all one and the same. Maybe we should just call it parrot disease, I don't know. But it's an occupational hazard especially if people are associated with the pet bird industry or turkey processing plants, because this occurs in turkeys. Uh, there are sporadic cases uh, uh, that have been reported with pet bird ownership. So if people don't understand how to raise these pet birds and take the necessary precautions to protect themselves from these potential uh, pathogens, then they'll they'll get this disease uh, at one point in their lives. So these are the clinical signs. Nasal discharge, ocular discharge, diarrhea, difficult breathing. Uh, so these pet birds will show uh, a lot of breathing difficulty, uh, discolored droppings, uh, shades of green in the feces, and progressive weight loss. They start getting weak and then droopy or sleepy, and of course, Telltale signs, something going on. Oh gosh, they're gonna stop eating and drinking completely. Then you have to make sure that you spot these signs early and consult a veterinarian, especially an exotic or avian veterinarian, to make sure that uh, your pet bird is taken care of and saved from potential death and uh, disease, progressive disease. Humans, well, as I said earlier, it can really cause fever, chills, headache, a lot of muscle aches, and uh, pneumonia. So you got to be careful with uh, handling these uh, citizen birds, these parrots. And of course, if you're dealing with turkeys, yes, be careful with that as well. Okay, moving on, erysipelas. This one is caused by this type of squiggly uh, organism, uh, Erysipelas rhizopathiae, it's another bacterium. It resides in both avian and mammalian hosts. It has been reported in domestic fowl or even feral avian species and captive wild birds and some mammals, even fish for that matter. But in poultry, uh, again, difficulty breathing, a discharge from the eyes, as, as we've been discussing these clinical signs, they can be mistaken for any of these diseases, right? You just don't know unless you submit uh, samples of uh, tissues or secretions, or for that matter, uh, sick birds or dead birds to a diagnostic laboratory, you will never confirm the exact cause of the problem. But anyway, you can narrow it down in terms of these types of uh, clinical signs. We, we have a question. Yes. Uh, with the chlamydiosis, is mm -hmm. it, when is it contagious at all times or when the birds are presenting with symptoms? Yeah, well, usually when they're shedding, when they have the disease and they're shedding the organism. Yeah, so when, that's, when that's, do, do they shed, shed all the time or just mm -hmm. when they show symptoms? No, no, usually when they show symptoms when they have the clinical disease. 
Okay. Yeah, other times they'll just harbor the disease in their system. It's just a regular pathogen in their guts or in their system. Okay. Right. Okay, well, erysipelas in humans, this is what you're gonna look like, all right? Not pretty, right? Fever, chills, uh, redness of the skin. But guess what? Uh, erysipelas in pigs, uh, pretty much the same clinical signs show up. It's kind of a, uh, well, there's a term for that, the diamond skin disease, I think they call it in pigs because of these uh, patches of red uh, diamond shaped uh, uh, skin lesions. People start showing these uh, signs and you pretty much know it's erysipelas. Blisters, they become uh, really blistery sometimes. Uh, they, uh, well, make people scratch a lot and it's very uncomfortable. Uh, Glands, uh, limb glands become swollen uh, as a response to the disease. So it's not pretty. And uh, there are ways, of course, to prevent these diseases from hitting you and your birds. Very basic things. It's, it's not rocket science, folks. Again, biosecurity, which includes these three major aspects, isolation isolation, traffic control, hygiene, and sanitation. Of course, isolation is keeping the uh, uh, birds confined. Traffic control is restricting the entry of people, vehicles, and equipment on and off the farm. And hygiene and sanitation is regular hand washing, uh, keeping things clean and disinfected. So if you don't have running water, of course, you can use uh, hand sanitizers, they're not always um, that effective. Nothing beats hand washing, that's for sure. But if you don't have running water, then use a 60% base alcohol as sanitizer to uh, sanitize your hands. And in terms of food safety, especially preventing salmonella and campylobacter or foodborne illness, always handle food safely, whether it's for yourself, your family, your pet, and other animals. Make sure that you're aware of these zoonotic diseases at home, away from home, like petting zoos, always have hand sanitizers ready. Uh, if you have a display going on, if you're an extension agent, uh, having a petting zoo display for kids, then make sure you have hand sanitizers all over the place and signs directing them to sanitize their hands after they handle the uh, animals. And of course, always cook your food well. What temperature? 165 Fahrenheit, I think. Um, the, make sure chopping boards are clean, always. It all starts with basic hygiene and sanitation, right? So that's all I have. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, no additional questions yet. So uh, if you have some questions, please type them in the Q&A and uh, we'll get Dr. Nathaniel to, um, to answer them. And while we are waiting, I'll let you know that the, um, the next webinar is October 2nd, talking about backyard poultry zoning regulations, working with your local authorities. In November, it's an overview of chicken anatomy. And in December, it's a feeding a small and backyard poultry flock. You can um, access the um, past webinars as well as the upcoming webinars at extension.org slash poultry and uh, send out reminders and other tidbits of news on our Facebook page. So check us out on Facebook, uh, a poultry extension. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions. You must Actually, have been I'll, in I'll throw one out while maybe while we're waiting for others to formulate theirs. Nathan, I'm wondering if uh, just thinking about it as the uh, parent of a small child, you know, vaccination numbers seem to be going down in a lot of places. Any issues with any of these diseases regarding uh, child vaccinations or anything uh, in that area? 
Uh, can you say that again? Child vaccinations? Yeah, I'm just, the, the, you know, child vaccination rates are going down in a lot of places. Mm. Parents are choosing not to vaccinate their kids. I mean, generally, the ones I heard didn't come to mind with some of the vaccinations that my daughter is getting. But I'm just wondering if any, if there's any. Uh, right, uh, right. Yeah, I guess you're talking about the regular kid vaccines like uh, for rubella, mumps, uh, and all these things. Um, well, when you talk about these uh, zoonotic diseases that I just discussed, it, it's really, um, they're not covered by those routine vaccinations that we give to our kids. Right. So there's no cross-infection there. So therefore, no cross-infection, no cross-protection either. I didn't think so. I didn't, none yeah, of them yeah. rang a bell for any, any anything that I was hearing, but I just right. thought I'd ask. I, I guess, you know, now that we're on the topic of immune, immunity or uh, immune response, uh, yeah, I should probably have started, should have started this uh, presentation with the basic concepts of disease causation, which I usually do anyway. I, I didn't know I was going to have so much time left over. <laughs> but, Lots yeah, of time. Because, uh, when you talk about, uh, as an epidemiologist, the, the basic tenets of, uh, of disease uh, causation is like, it, it all has to do with three major factors, agent, host, and environment. So the agent would be the infectious agents that we just discussed, whether it's bacteria, fungi, protozoa, or viruses. And the host is the animal or human that actually gets infected with that. And the environment is where we or the animals reside. So those factors have to interact to cause disease. So in a dirty environment with a host that's immune compromised or not healthy, because of improper nutrition or improper or lack of vaccination, uh, those are the most likely to get infected or to break with disease. Mm -hmm. So understanding those basic principles means like if you're the host as a human, protect yourself by eating well and making yourself, getting regular exercise, fresh air, tender loving care from whoever, and the same thing you do for your beloved animals, whether you raise them as pets or for food, right? Yeah. Because there's it. not much you can do from the other end, really. Uh, when it comes to these infectious agents, what are you going to do? You're just trying to prevent them from entering your poultry farm or from infecting you and your animals. And so you do that by what? Through biosecurity. And if they get in, then you try to stop them from further spreading through what? Cleaning and disinfection or eliminating the sources of, of the infected materials. That's why we have what? Depopulation during avian influenza outbreaks and disposal of carcasses immediately within 24 hours and cleaning and disinfection within 24 hours. Sorry, I digress, but I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, great. We mm -hmm. have two questions. One is the flu vaccine for kids. Does it provide any protection for, I assume, avian influenza? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Thank you for asking that. No, not directly. However, please have your kids vaccinated and please get vaccinated for seasonal human flu. Because the last thing you want to do is to have you or your kid become a mixing vessel for a new strain of influenza virus. What happens is if you're protected against the regular seasonal human flu and a bird flu virus gets into you, your chances of preventing that flu virus from mutating inside you are better than someone who has not gotten a vaccine at all. So you're decreasing the chances of you getting or becoming a mixing vessel. But by that I mean, you know, these, these influenza viruses are so good at mutating, especially the H5 and H7 strains. Like, for example, this outbreak we had in the Midwest in 2015, luckily no people, no humans got infected, but those started out as a different strain of low pathogenic influenza viruses carried by waterfowl, migratory waterfowl from China, low pathogenic H5N8. But when those droppings or feces from those waterfowl infected our domestic birds, they became highly pathogenic H5N2, and it spread like wildfire. So mutation can occur in humans as well, and you don't want to be the site of that mutation. 
we should say that the uh, the Chinese uh, avian influenza virus that caused human disease is not currently in the United States. No, no, it has never been here, and ho hopefully, it hopefully never, it never here. will be. Yeah, we've isolated. I mean, we as Americans and USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, actually does all these isolations and genetic sequencing. We've had some isolates of low pathogenic H5N1. However, the genetic sequence of those viruses are very different from those highly pathogenic strains that are circulating, are circulating in Asia. So we've never had any of those in poultry and humans. Right. Uh, another question is, how many human cases of Newcastle were in the outbreak in California? Uh, I have no clue as to this current outbreak. I haven't outbreak, heard of any. Yeah. I have not heard of any. You know what? Uh, I've heard about cases really not even related to the wild outbreaks or, you know, the reported outbreaks in birds. Uh, people getting infected with live vaccines. So it becomes more of an occupational risk. I mean, if you're in a, a member of a vaccination crew vaccinating for Newcastle disease in chickens and you don't wear gloves or don't wash your hands and then you start rubbing your eyes because it gets pretty, you know, dusty inside a poultry house. Before you know it, you're suffering from conjunctivitis. That's that's paramyxovirus or Newcastle disease virus. I, I wouldn't have a clue as to whether some people have gotten infected over in the current outbreak in California? I haven't heard of any. I think USDA would have said on their right, right. Week, weekly alerts. Right. Um, the yeah. only cases that I've ever seen of Newcastle in humans were from mm -hmm. vaccines. Yeah, and I met some of these USDA and uh, California veterinarians over at the uh, veterinary medical convention just last July, and I didn't see any of them with red eyes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Any more questions? I'm not seeing any. So uh, looks like we're going to finish up early, which is n not that bad since the subject was well covered. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. Well, thank you for having me. And as I said, the next one is in October, October 2nd uh, at 3 p.m., I believe. And uh, again, backyard poultry zoning regulations, uh, working with your local authorities so that if you want to have poultry uh, and you're not currently allowed, what sort of things can you do? Uh, arguments can you make with your local authorities? So thank you very much, Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Mark. Mm -hmm. We are finished. Um, thank everybody for attending and hopefully we will see you next month. All right, thank you. Have a great fall semester. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.